This is the Dave Fox Home Remodeling Show, and I'm Gary Demas. I'm really glad to be here this morning on this Sunday, April 11th. And we're into April already, Jamie. I know. Weather's getting nice. Vitamin hey. D's loading up. <laughs> That's right. Vitamin D. I have to quit taking so many vitamin D pills now because I'm yeah. getting real vitamin D from the sun. Yes. April showers bring May flowers, right? Hey, I'll take it. As long as there's some sunshine mixed in there and the weather keeps getting mm-hmm. warmer, I'm happy. April showers also hold up room additions. They do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an unfortunate occurrence of the spring. Yep. Um, okay, so we appreciate everybody tuning in this morning. You can always reach us by email, info at davefox.com. If you ever have any questions or thoughts, just comments for us. We'd love to hear from you. We like hearing from our listeners. Uh, if you see one of our trucks or cars with the logo on it at the gas station, just go up and say, hey, we listen to you guys on the radio. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I'll have people come up and do that when I'm filling up the vehicle. Yeah. That's always fun. Um, and then you can go to our website, davefox.com. And there's a lot of stuff in there, isn't there, Jamie, on our website? Oh, yes. All sorts of fun information. Um, I think getting the Getting Started tab on our website is probably the most informative for mm-hmm. anyone thinking about doing a project. Um, or if you're just kind of wanting to look at Endless Inspiration, our photo gallery. It's hours of fun. <laughs> Endless Inspiration. I like that. Yeah. That's a good phrase. There you go. Okay. It's coming from a marketing person. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so... And then DaveFoxRadio.com is where you can go to find any of our previously broadcast radio shows or different podcasts. I don't I don't search podcasts anywhere else, so you know more about that than I do, Jamie. Yeah, so our radio show is also available on all podcast platforms. So whether that's Apple Podcla- Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or even the iHeartMedia app, um, we're on there as well. Mm-hmm. So really just... Anywhere you listen to anything, you should be able to find us. Pretty easy. Dave Fox Home Remodeling Show. Mm -hmm. Okay. So last week, Jamie, we were talking about permitting Mm -hmm. uh, projects. When do you need to get a permit? Uh, A lot of the different hoops that we jump through getting permits sometimes. All the different municipalities. And a lot of them have their own little ideas on what they like and what they don't like. And then, as you mentioned last week, there's the Ohio Building Code, which is kind of blankets the whole state. <clears throat> and that's a big book. It makes great reading, you know, if you're ever interested at night and falling asleep. <laughs> Light reading. A great book to, yeah. to start reading. It'll certainly put you to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember years ago, my dad was an electrical contractor. And he needed to pass, <clears throat> this is when I was in, I don't know, high school or junior high. He needed to pass a, a code test for electric. So what he did is he had me read the code book into a tape recorder. So there was no digital recording back then. It was on tape. Yeah. <clears throat> he had me make these tapes and then he would listen to them as he was driving to work and co- driving back. Oh my gosh. that's hilarious. So I would read the code book <laughs> and, uh, on these tapes and he would listen to them and he passed the test. And he said, one of the things that helped him was like, if I mispronounced something or did something a little off, that helped him remember you yeah. know, because it was like an event that was a little out of the ordinary. That's funny. But uh, that was interesting. He paid me a few bucks for doing that. Your first Audible. Yeah. My <laughs> first, I created the first Audible book. I know. If wow. only you would have, you know. I could have sold that. You could have really been on the <clears throat> onto something. building code. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right. You should find those old tapes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're long gone. <laughs> All right, yeah, code requirements are are definitely something special. And I think some of them, actually almost all of them, I think make a lot of good sense. They're mostly common sense that should be followed. And, but like you said, you know, with a lot of builders and buildings being done to the minimum, sometimes these minimums take into account, you know, old homes in like in German village. We still have to be able to, even if we have to remodel and bring things up to code, those codes still need to work within a home that's that old, you know, and Mm -hmm. and within the parameters of those walls and things like that. So there's um, kind of that idea in mind of when you're building new, it's a lot easier to fit in all these building codes and and make them all work because 
you're kind of you're not yeah. limited on walls. Right. <laughs> um, but once the house is already there, you can be pretty limited on, mm -hmm. on some things. But uh, we, let's start with outlets, electrical okay. outlets. Everyone kind of knows or has a general idea that there's some sort of code requirement with outlets and you know the GFCI and and mm -hmm. different and how far apart they are, how many in a room, things like that. Yeah, and a lot of people would say, is there a code that requires outlets to be behind every sofa in the room so you can't get to it? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not a code for that. It <laughs> just works out that well. That's right. Hmm. <clears throat> okay, right. so who, you're going to take the GFIs, GFCIs? Well, I so I never knew this. They, it hmm? stands for Ground Fault Circuit Interpreter. Interrupter. Interrupter. Yeah. <laughs> that makes more sense. It interrupts the circuit. <laughs> interrupts the circuit. Yeah, kills the power Yeah. if it's tripped. Okay, and so the main thing with those is anywhere near water, right? <laughs> yeah. So what this is, it's actually a, a pretty uh, ingenious device. Um, you've heard years ago, like somebody might get electrocuted in the the bathtub because they were holding a hair dryer or something. Right, That's a, I don't recommend doing that. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> but the GFCI, what it would do is if it sensed any current going through the neutral ground wire, it would it kills the circuit. So it interrupts the circuit. So it's a ground fault. If that ground wire is carrying any current, it's gonna stop the circuit right away <clears throat> and trip it. So to save you from being electrocuted to death in your bathtub. Okay. Right. So that sounds like a pretty good one to follow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Now, when they first came out, any new technology is gonna be a little tricky and you know have some kinks in it. And mm -hmm. sometimes those things were just tricked tripping way too often yeah and i can remember we would be back changing out a different one for you know if one was tripping we'd be putting another one in there yeah i don't rem recall us running into that much anymore i think they've got that pretty well perfected <clears throat> so i have one in my house that trips all the time okay it's on it's on our coffee bar which is extensive because my husband yeah. loves coffee <laughs> and it trips yeah, oscar's just making too much coffee though. i That's why. i agree <laughs> he's very into coffee <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, we have every single kind of possible way to make coffee <laughs> in our house on this coffee bar. And it ends up tripping a lot. Now, is changing out the actual outlet plate going to do anything? Or wh what part would need change? Okay, here's how that works. <clears throat> you can take, there's two ways to get a GFI circuit. I, I just leave the C out because it's easier to say GFI than GFCI. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you can have an outlet that's made as the circuit interrupter and it carries that ground fault circuit interruption circuitry in it. And then you can feed wire off that outlet to a couple other outlets that'll still be protected by that outlet. So like maybe in the bathroom, if you have three outlets and there's one GFI outlet there, it's feeding those other two outlets so they're all protected. Mm -hmm. That's one way of doing it. Yes. So you could be tripping the circuit by plugging something into another outlet, then you would know it's it's in line with that GFI. Yes. The other way to do it is to put the breaker on your panel down in your basement or crawl space or wherever it is. So the panel is gonna have a GFI, so any outlet that's on that circuit is gonna be protected. So those are the two ways that you may uh, find whatever you've tripped. Yeah. So in your case, if if it's a GFI circuit right at the wall that keeps tripping, I would replace that with a new one just uh -huh. to see if that made a difference. Okay. And if it doesn't, then it's Oscar's fault. <laughs> he needs to be careful what he's doing there. <laughs> I mean, I agree. Okay. But ours, ours do trip <clears throat> oddly easily. Um, like for an example, our range. I did the self. We have a self cleaning oven, mm -hmm. and it can't run it. It trips it every time. Oh, that's just because your circuit isn't large enough amperage, probably. So well, that's your, a bummer. Your oven's drawing more <laughs> amps than that breaker will allow it to take. Oh. So you need to, that's a whole different story because the wire feeding it has to be big enough to handle the amperage. So you can't just change the circuit breaker to a larger one because you'd have to make sure the wire is big enough to handle it. Oh my. So now everybody's going to be a professional electrician after listening to this. So we All better right. get out and uh, come back after the break. Welcome back to the Dave Fox Home Remodeling Show. We're here every single Sunday morning at 8 o'clock for your listening pleasure. Right, Jamie? <laughs> That's right. Uh, today is uh, code requirements. And yes. We're making everybody an official 
code examiner. Yeah. <laughs> so you can email us at infodayfox.com. We'll give you your certificate if you promise that you listen to the whole radio show, right? There you go. And just show that to your board official and he'll say, what on earth is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we were talking about outlets mm-hmm. um, and the GFCIs, but then there's also another kind of element to that with the code requirements of the spacing of the outlets. Yeah. Um, and so my understanding is in the kitchen, for example, anywhere there's a, a countertop, they have to be four feet apart. Mm-hmm. And then also within two feet of the end of your countertop. Correct. That's a lot of outlets. It is, but wh- why do you think they have so many in the kitchen? And why do they have to be so close? Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess for everything you plug in, so you're not pulling it too far away. Yeah, because you use, typically have a lot of small appliances that plug in, you know, your little mixer, who knows what, electric yeah. knife. And they don't want you like stretching cords or having to put extension cords on anything. They okay. want to make sure that you can reach an outlet and do whatever work you need to do anywhere on that counter space. And same way on an island. You yeah. Know, you've got to have outlets on an island for the same reason. They don't want extension cords draping across from, you know, your exterior wall counter across to an island, creating a hazard that way. So it's just common sense stuff. Uh, you know, you need more outlets in the kitchen because you have all the small appliances mm-hmm. and it avoids having running extension cords. Yes. It's given the, the designers lots of room for creativity on, exactly. on how to hide them, <laughs> how to hide them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause they, you know, it's a sh- shame sometimes when you have this beautiful backsplash and then those pesky outlets have to be there, mm-hmm. but they have come up with some great ways to hide them. Yeah. But yeah. All right. So Next up, outlets we covered for code requirements, egress. So egress windows and, and kind of exit routes. Mm-hmm. Um, egress actually means the act of going out or leaving a place or the way to do so. Okay. So there you go. So if you need to get out of your house, you need to go to an egress. That's right. And so they have specifications as far as the minimum openings, um, even the openings for your entry door and things like that are kind of all part of the that code Mm -hmm. um is my understanding and then some minimums and windows and do you want to talk a little bit about that especially egress and basements have become increasingly popular well demanded (laughs) uh, bedrooms is really critical too yeah Uh, and they're all in case typically you have a fire right so you've got to get out. You can't necessarily go into the hallway of a home to escape through the door. Maybe that's where the fire's at. So you're mm-hmm. stuck in your bedroom. Maybe it's a second floor bedroom. So how are you going to get out? Or even better yet, how's the fireman going to get to you and save you? Right. So <clears throat> the egress openings or windows are the sizes that are required for a fireman to get through a window with all of his gear on so that he can get in and rescue your child. It's an interesting way of thinking of it. The, yeah. the fireman and all of his gear to get in. Yeah. Yeah. So he's sending his ladder up, climbing up to that window, climbing in there and rescuing your child. There you have it. So that would be for bedrooms uh, uh-huh. on the first floor or second floor or whatever. And then in basements, in sleeping rooms is where you'll need an egress. Okay. And um, this is relatively new. Uh, code, you know, the last eight or 10 years Uh where it's been uh, enforced and it's an important, well, probably more than that. It's probably been 15 years. I don't know. Time flies. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, if you're going to have a sleeping room or any room that you sleep in, whether you call it the sleeping room or not, (laughs) it's there. It's just for the safety of your family. Yeah. So again, you'll need that window with a certain amount of square footage, uh, and egress windows can typically be put in for, you know, in the under $5,000. If you don't have one and if you've got one of your children sleeping in the basement, you need to put an egress window in that room. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it says here that the minimum opening is a width of 20 inches and the height of 24 inches. Yeah. So that's the opening size. Yeah. Minimum opening size. <clears throat> yeah. So that doesn't account for... The frame of the window you know when that window is open if it's a sliding window or a a double hung when you open it the clear opening has to be those dimensions oh yeah Yeah. okay Mm -hmm. so that makes sense 
And then smoke alarms. We talked about this a little bit on our last last week's episode, um, but there's some code requirements there as far as where they need to be. Um, and then, so it's typically in every sleeping area. Mm-hmm. Um, one located in the path of the means of the egress for a sleeping area or to the door leading from that sleeping area. Mm-hmm. And then we've run into issues prior of if we're updating an older home in say upper Arlington, they can, even if you're just doing the kitchen, they can make you update the whole house, right? Yeah, they will make you update They will the make house. you update the whole mm-hmm. house. Yeah. That's interesting. And so typically in an older home, there's not one in all the sleeping areas or? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and usually what you'll find is maybe one or two in the hallways that are just battery powered. Yeah. Because any homeowner could put those up. Uh, <clears throat> but it is an important thing. Smoke detectors are lifesavers if sure. there's a fire. So it also gets more complicated in the different types that are available and how they're powered. Right. So, <clears throat> you know, you've got just the typical battery units and then everybody's familiar with the little chirping sound, you know, sure. when the battery's <laughs> starting to chirp and you're so yeah. mad at that thing, you rip that battery out and forget about it. Yeah. You stick it in the garage so you can't hear it. <laughs> yeah. But if it's hardwired, okay, so if you got a battery plus line voltage feeding it, then it doesn't let you get away with that. You know, it keeps chirping at you. Um, so almost all municipalities require a, what we call hardwired smoke detector. So it's got the battery plus a hard wire feeding it. Okay. So that way, if, if your house loses power, you still got the battery there. Uh, so you're still protected. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then the next level that came out was the interconnected smoke detector. So if one goes off, all of them in the house go off. Oh, well, I could see that being beneficial. Yeah. So that's uh, the new thing in a lot of municipalities. Um, now they will grant you some leniency there. Typically, if you're in a if you're in a remodeling situation, and if you'd have to tear up drywall all through the house to make that happen, then a lot of times they won't inf- make you do that. Yeah, that's very thoughtful of them because <laughs> that'd be a lot of work and a lot of expense. Yeah, it definitely would be uh, a little bit more than you bargained for. And then there's also smart ones too because i know like nest has their own line of of smoke detectors and one thing i thought was interesting is i don't know how in our home i wasn't sure how to tell if it's just a smoke detector or a smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector Mm -hmm. and i remember i spent a few years now when that um unfortunate situation in westerville happened with the family with the carbon monoxide I, it was the first time I ever considered it, and I'm checking all of them, and I couldn't tell. So we just bought a bunch of carbon monoxide detectors too. Yeah. <laughs> like I'd rather <laughs> let's make sure we have it. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to tell on there if it's both. Yeah, you it don't is. know. Yeah, but you want to make sure if you don't know for sure, just to get a couple carbon monoxide ones and get them in your home. Yeah, that's what we did. Mm-hmm. Um, it was definitely a wake up call, though. Mm-hmm. So, but all right, and then kind of a big topic is stairs and railings. Yeah. There's a there's a lot to that. And it's funny too, because you notice when you go upstairs and you're like, man, these are steep stairs. It's the first thing you say when you go up a steep set of stairs or kind of think to yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes you wonder yourself, did that, are those, are these to code? Yeah. <laughs> is this right? Because mm-hmm. it, it can definitely make you feel like you're climbing a mountain. Yeah, as you say, there's a lot of different things to take into consideration there. A lot of times the basements can be a real challenge too. Mm-hmm. So um, w- um, we'll talk about, there's the rise and the run. We'll talk about what that means and what those dimensions typically are uh, right after the break. So Jamie, we're going to talk about the rise and the run, okay? All right. The sun rises and what runs? You. I, that's the <laughs> truth. Okay. <laughs> There we go. All now, right. what else are we going to talk about? I don't know. Let's <laughs> talk about some stairs. Okay. All right. So, as you mentioned right before this segment began, right at the end of the last segment, uh, stairs can be tricky when we talk about codes. And you mentioned, like, running into a real steep set of stairs. So, what in your mind makes a steep set of stairs? What was it about those stairs that made them feel steep? Um, I think when there's no landing... They tend to feel a little steeper without kind of that break. 
Okay. And then um, just to, maybe it was the the run felt short. Mm-hmm. I think that too yep. can make it feel steep. Definitely. Um, and then just looking up and <laughs> being a little daunting about <laughs> mm-hmm. how many are left. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that kind of the combination of those or it's just an overall feeling and you can't quite put your finger on it, but you feel like these are steep stairs. Yeah. I say typically there's two things that could make them feel steep. And we talk about the rise and the run. So Mm -hmm. obviously the rise is how high are the treads from one another? Yeah. How high are they going up? And then there's the run is how much surface do I have to put my foot on? So a typical rise and run is going to be around seven and a quarter rise by nine and a quarter run Mm -hmm. that'll be kind of a traditional you know basement stairs going down to the basement yeah um sometimes you have opportunity to make the run a little longer which can make the the stairs less steep and feel more comfortable yeah you know maybe you have a 12 inch run and there you got plenty of room for your feet and Mm -hmm. your steps are a little further apart that'd be very comfortable set of stairs to go up and down uh, but if the rise, so code is going to require, I think, I can't, I don't know exactly what code is, maybe seven and a half. I know it wouldn't be more than eight inches for the rise as a maximum. Yeah. So code's not going to per- permit any rise that's higher than that number, whether it's seven and a half or eight, I don't know, <clears throat> offhand. The run, I think the minimum is going to be in the nine inch range. Um, so just to meet code today, the stairs shouldn't feel super steep. Right. Yeah. But a lot of older homes or situations where maybe something wasn't permitted, you may have a situation, as I mentioned, basements can be tricky because Mm -hmm. let's imagine you're at the main level of your floor and you're going to go down to the basement and the basements go pretty much into the the outside basement wall. Yeah. So that wall is there and it's not moving. Right. You only have a certain amount of distance for those stairs to project out towards that wall. Uh Uh-huh. So there's a lot of cases where that just shortens the stairway maybe more than is comfortable. Or maybe mm-hmm. you have to go to the very minimum to meet code. Uh, in remodeling situations where we're changing things around, sometimes we literally don't have enough room to do that. And we'll have to do some major alteration to make a set of stairs work. Yeah, and I think that's when, you know, sometimes in those situations is where you kind of run into where the stairs do a kind of a switch back or Mm-hmm. turn or yeah. angle and have a landing to yeah. break it up too um can be be helpful i know i personally always prefer a landing mm-hmm. um i just think for whatever reason it flows better doesn't yeah. feel like you're going up a flight of stairs yeah um but it takes up a lot of space stairs take up a ton of space they in do. house. they're they really cumbersome a, <laughs> a lot of space and everything the whole floor plan is built around the stairs yeah so that's why it's really hard and difficult to to relocate a set of stairs in a home. It's kind mm-hmm. of like trying to relocate your heart. You got all these arteries running to it, you know. Yeah. It's a challenge. So a, set, a stairway, typically the whole floor plan is built around the stairs and they're not easy to change. Yeah, and I also, I notice a big difference in kind of the feeling a house gives by the width of the stairway. Mm-hmm. I think it could be a huge house, but if it has a narrow stairway, yeah. it all of a sudden the whole house feels smaller. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always think it's worth those extra inches of the width of the stair. Mm -hmm. Like, I'd rather have wider stairs in a smaller family room. Yeah, that's quite a tension in laying out a floor plan because you're giving up precious floor space, right, to make those stairs wider. So, But you're right, it is important, and uh, even hallways, too. If you've got hallways that are going to be, you know, two people traveling them. yeah. You know, you need to be wider than your typical 36 inches. But it's like it hurts when you're creating a floor plan because you know you're giving up precious floor space for the living room, the family room, the kitchen, who knows what. Yeah, I know. They're they're tough decisions, but um, they definitely can make a big impact, Mm -hmm. even just six inches. Yeah. I mean, it's huge what a difference that can make in in both areas sometimes. But Mm -hmm. I think, too, the... um, the head clearance, which isn't always so much an issue for me. I'm only about five <laughs> feet. <laughs> so I don't typically run into head clearance issues, mm-hmm. but I would imagine you run into head clearance issues. Literally run into. Run into, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, and I'll have a lot of times when we're in an old Clintonville home or something, and the homeowners will say, now watch your head coming down here, you know, and I say, oh, thank you, yes, definitely, yeah. I'll watch my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you're what, six, three? Six, three, yeah. Six, three, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so you got a, a foot and a couple inches on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd imagine there's some... Uh, yeah, see all these marks on my forehead? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I think, um, especially in those older homes, people used to be shorter. So yeah. they didn't even need to have that kind of headspace and, and things so like that. So they didn't have Wheaties back then? No, apparently no. not. Okay. But yeah, I think that, so the minimum clearance um, is six feet, eight inches, mm-hmm. above the front edge of any tread, which is quite low. Uh, six feet, eight inches? Yeah. Yeah, that's really you a typical kinda, door height. Yeah, barely. So like the typical door is going to be six foot, eight inches, 80, yeah. 80 inches. Yeah. But when you're going at it at an angle, yeah, it's a little different. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you really want to probably stick to more seven feet plus. Okay. Um, Sounds good to me. Clearance. That sounds good. Yeah. But then again, a lot of times in remodeling, let's say we're finishing a basement mm-hmm. and we're working with an existing structure and existing ceiling heights and maybe the basement ceiling height itself is seven feet, seven feet period. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of times you're in situations where it's just really challenging to get those numbers to work. Yeah, definitely. I know in my uh, grandmother's house growing up, we used to always be in the basement was kind of her main living space actually Mm -hmm. was in the basement. And my cousins are very tall. I don't know where they came from, but they're (laughs) six, five plus. Yeah. And they're very tall and none of them could stand in the basement. (laughs) Really? Yeah. Wow. She put chairs on like desk chairs down there so they could sit down and wheel around, (laughs) get to places. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, they, none of them could stand down there. Mm. Poor things. (laughs) But yeah, I think, you know, with stair railings and everything, I, um, the actual banisters and the railings all Mm -hmm. have um, really specific code requirements as well. Yeah. And again, all for safety. I mean, all these code requirements are really for safety and, and worth following. Um, but, and the railing at 36 inches is kind of the requirement. It feels right for, I think everybody, it doesn't Mm -hmm. feel too low or too high. And Mm -hmm. I think it's a very good, it's a very sensible place for it to be, especially that's where your kitchen counter is, things like that. Mm -hmm. I think it makes a lot of sense, but um, yeah, we recently did a project in Westerville that's kind of in a really unique home. And the railing went up and there was, I don't know, a two foot gap just opening in the railing. And so we filled it in with glass. But I can't imagine if that glass wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a dog, a cat, a kid. <laughs> yeah. Go right through it. Well, the, the uh, spacing or any opening in a railing, you cannot allow a four inch sphere to push through because that represents like a, a toddler's head. Yeah. So you wouldn't want a little toddler to get his head stuck in your stair. So the four inch is the key uh, dimension. So your balusters can't be more than four inches apart. Uh, the distance from your bottom rail to the floor can't be more than four inches. So there's no area in that stairs that can have a gap wider than the four inches. Yeah, I wonder when these uh, these homes were built <laughs> that they were able to get away with that opening. Yeah, Be things interesting. change over time. <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we got the stair codes all kind of taken care of. You have your rise and your run and you're getting up there. We'll figure out what's next after the break. All right. And welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Dave Fox Home Remodeling Show. We love being here every Sunday morning at 8, don't we, Jamie? Don't we love being here every Sunday morning at 8? It's the best. It's the best, right. <laughs> there was a hesitation there. I'm wondering about that now. No, it's All of the our best. listeners are going to think, well, maybe Jamie doesn't think this is the greatest thing. I love being here every okay, Sunday morning. Okay, that's more like it. All right. So we're all resting easy knowing that Jamie doesn't mind being here Sunday mornings at 8. That's right. Okay, so we're talking about Stair railings, right? Yeah, we were talking about stair railings and building codes. um, And the there's kind of a lot of nuances with stair railings. And we don't put in that many stairs, um, I would say, with remodeling. We make a lot of modifications, um, do a lot of railings, but not necessarily the whole staircase. um, Yeah, not that often. often. Unless we're just replacing a whole staircase for for aesthetics. Yeah. Or um, actually, this project that I was just talking about in the last segment that we were just at photographing, 
they had a, a ladder that went up to this loft area. Mm -hmm. And they thought it was a retired couple. We're never going to use this ladder mm -hmm. to go up there. You know, what else could we do? And so we ended up putting in a staircase up to the loft area. And now he he calls it his man loft. It's his oh, little office and it's okay. got his music up there. And it's a very useful, functional space now. Yeah. But the coolest part was underneath the staircase, we were able to really maximize kind of that area and um, have additional storage. Mm -hmm. And they're all the touch opening so you just kind of push them in to open so there's nice. no hardware you can't even tell it's there mm -hmm. and it all opens there's extra hanging in there there's extra shoe storage mm -hmm. and then there was even a cubby for the dogs little extra stuff so yeah. they could have their treats and everything up there <laughs> yeah i remember a project we did recently and bob our fantastic amazing carpenter was putting in a timber frame stairway i think we're talking about the same one okay yeah, yeah. so we have a video of that oh really yeah oh, cool. it's on youtube somewhere all right yeah um uh, it's out there somewhere under Day Fox, something or other. Okay, and that's I'll link it to this views. episode. Yeah, it's gotten a lot of views. Yeah, that's super really cool. really interesting. Great. Well, yep. now we have the after pictures of it, too, yep. which will uh -huh. be fun to share. Yep. All right, great. Well, so some other building codes um, that some people have a hard time have a hard time with, kind of what we were talking about earlier with the maybe over-engineering of some things mm -hmm. is, you know, it used to be that nails were used for everything. And now there's a lot, our homes are designed to withstand a lot more hurricanes, tornadoes, blizzards, snow, wind, all of it. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot more hardware involved in that. Yeah. So there's, you know, the frames, the anchors, connectors, fasteners, everything to hold everything together. Yep. Um, and there's a lot of building codes associated with those. Yeah. And that's why the Simpson Fastener Company exists, because they make every kind, any kind of connecting fastener you could ever imagine, and more. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. So there are a lot of building plans will pull out, uh, will will designate at like an intersection between framing members. Use Simpson number blah 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 blah. So it's a particular connector that's designed to hold those two structural hmm. members together. Interesting. They make amazing. Their catalog's amazing all the different things that they make. Wow, it's amazing how many, you know, when you think about all these different codes and everything that goes into a remodeling projects, how many jobs there are kind of spearheaded from your kitchen remodel. There's the cabinet manufacturer, mm, there's yeah. the building inspectors, there's, you know, everyone in a firm like ours. Mm -hmm. And then in all these different products and materials, even those little things that you don't even know exist behind your walls, how mm -hmm. much work and these companies go into it. It's amazing. Yeah. It's but you're so right. Cool. The engineering behind these connection points uh, has really improved a lot over the years. Used to be, as long as I can remember, there were what we call joist hangers. Mm -hmm. So it's just a sheet metal U-channel thing that you nail into a joist, and then the, the joist that's perpendicular to it sets into it, and it just kind of adds some strength where it meets <clears throat> a joist perpendicular. So joist hangers have been around a long time, but since then they've created so many different really neat connecting uh, brackets for all different scenarios. So that way you're, because a lot of those you used to just depend on nails or screws, and now you've got uh, these metal connectors that are much more strong, much stronger, I should say. Yeah, definitely. And now, so I also have that there's building codes associated with shear walls. What's a shear wall? Okay, so that has to do with the wind, basically, a oh. wind, wind component pressing on your home. Mm -hmm. And the the shear part is if you uh, kind of a, how would I describe that? It's it's not a linear compression, it's, it's, it's along the, the wall itself. So if you have a wall and another wall is pushing against the end of it. You don't want that wall to to not maintain its rigidity and let, let the wall that's against it. <laughs> this is hard to describe. <laughs> <laughs> Sheer strength. But that's going to be in your uh, bracing in a wall. So there's used to be we would just take one by fours on a frame wall, two by four frame wall, and we'd cut an angle brace at each end of that wall. We just cut a notch three quarters of an inch deep at an angle and then nail this one by four in there. 
So that gives you some sheer strength. It keeps that wall from rocking one way or the other. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that was the old way of doing it. Honestly, when your exterior sheathing goes on and your interior drywall go- goes on, that adds a tremendous amount of sheer strength to a wall. Yeah. Um, there's cases where maybe you've got a wall that has a bunch of big window openings in it. Mm-hmm. So that greatly reduces the shear strength because you're taking all of those components out. You're taking the exterior sheathing and drywall out and you just have these little narrow spots between windows. So that wall is very susceptible to shear, uh, I want to say distortion. So they've got special end wall. Simpson makes like these end walls that are designed to counteract that and add a bunch of shear strength to that wall. Very cool. Yeah. So there's. All right. So it's typically only an exterior wall. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. All right. And then there's even codes for termite and moisture protection. Uh, you got the you know flashing and the ventilation, foundation, ceiling mm-hmm. requirements. It's, yeah. There's codes for all of that. Yes. Uh, to make sure to protect your home, really. Right. So adding vapor barriers where they're needed. <clears throat> um, treated lumber to minimize termite infest infestation mm-hmm. uh, and you've got framing members meeting a concrete floor which is susceptible to causing moisture to come up through those have to be treated members uh, vapor barriers are really important because as we all know <clears throat> in the winter time warm moist air holds a lot or warm air holds a lot of moisture Mm-hmm. Cold air does not hold moisture or cold surfaces. So that's why we got the con- condensation of water beads on a glass pane if the glass is too cold in the wintertime. So the warm air inside the house holds more moisture. It's that glass pane. You get condensation. Sure. Well, that can happen in a wall, too. Mm-hmm. So that's why we have vapor barriers in walls to help protect uh, that moisture infiltration or separate the cold from the warm. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And um, so then there's also, we have insulation um, with energy code requirements and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then even- ever increasing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And then also even plumbing fixture requirements. Um, And I think this is something that's probably gonna continue to get more defined and a little stricter is with the water usage regulations. You know, a lot of things that start out in California kind of end up becoming more normal throughout the rest of the country as well, especially with the green kind of movement, Mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So Jamie, we've covered a variety of topics having to do with permitting and codes here over the last two weeks. So in case anybody missed part of this show or last week's show, they can go to dayfoxradio.com and there they can listen to them or watch them on video. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So uh, we've got a good show in store for next week, but I don't know what it is yet, but we'll figure (laughs) something out, won't we, Jamie? Absolutely. Okay, so we appreciate everybody tuning in very much. We love to have our loyal listeners get in touch with us. You can email us at info at davefox.com, even if you're not a loyal listener. You can still (laughs) still email us. We'll see you next week.